Hello again everyone and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today I'm going to be doing a really interesting video. I'm going to be uh, unboxing what many uh, people consider to be the finest camera which Nikon ever produced. Uh, which is a really big deal when you consider uh, the numbers and types of cameras which Nikon has produced over the years. Uh, this camera is the 2005 Nikon SP Limited Edition camera. This camera was a ground-up reproduction of the original Nikon SP, which was produced back in the 1950s. And that was a professional quality camera designed to compete against the Leica M3. And a lot of people, uh, though I'm a really big uh, lover of Leica cameras, uh, and I, I might not have much to say about uh, which is better in the 1950s, the Nikon SP or the Leica M3, because I love them both. But if I'm comparing this uh, newer, uh, I guess newly produced SP against an, uh, a Leica S3, uh, I, I would say this camera is superior in just about every way. It's amazing that the Nikon produced this camera. Uh, it was released in 2005, uh, about one year after Nikon uh, produced its last professional quality uh, film camera, the F6. And at the same time they were manufacturing the SP, they were also producing the FM3A, which a lot of people regard as another one of Nikon's great film cameras. So, uh, I'm going to take a break for a moment and then we'll go ahead and get into the unboxing and talking a little bit more about this camera. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. And the first thing we have here is this very typical uh, Nikon outer box, which looks like a lot like the boxes which contain the Nikon's more modern digital cameras. The same kind of gold color, the same emblem here. Uh, the only thing is the SP Limited Edition. Uh, go ahead and pop this open and open up the inside. And uh, the first thing I see here is, of course, the SP Limited Edition box, which uh, contains the camera itself and some accessories on this side. Uh, we have this cloth bag or whatever it is. I'm not going to open this, but it, it's something wrapped in cloth, some kind of something. I don't think the, the documents and stuff are on the inside. Uh, as this is kind of a very collectible camera and it's kind of important for, uh, I guess, to retain the, the value of this camera, it's a good idea not to lose any of the original things. So I'm just gonna leave this uh, sealed as it is. Uh, over here we have camera case for SP. I'll go ahead and uh, take this out and open it. And as you can see, uh, even though this camera was uh, sold for the, the Japanese market and was not exported, uh, the very fact that a few of these cameras might make it to America made it necessary to put these warning scripts on the plastic bag. This is just in case uh, you buy a, a camera and your a toddler decides he wants to go out and take photos with it and takes the plastic out and maybe chokes on it. Uh, a lot of you may not be aware that uh, America has, I believe was it, 6% uh, of the world's population, but nearly 60% of the world's lawyers. And that's kind of the reason why you see warning labels on plastic bags on things which are sold even in Japan, or meant to be sold only in Japan. And of course, the main, uh, the main script is in English. I'll go ahead and set this aside now. And no offense to all you lawyers out there who might be watching this. I really love you guys, really. So let's go ahead and uh, take out the box on the inside, the camera itself. And this is very similar to the uh, old Nikon uh, rangefinder cameras. And believe it or not, I've come across an occasional camera which still has its original outer and inner boxes. Uh, if you open up the outer box, of course you see the inner box. And uh, the script and the style of the box is very close to the original style of the, the 1950s uh, uh, Nikon SPs and I'll go ahead and as you can see it still has the tissue on it and the, the seal. I'll go ahead and take this out. Oop. I have to be more careful taking things out. All right so here we have uh, okay I guess this is the original literature which comes with the camera. We have um, I'll pop these open here see what we have. Uh, we have the original uh, warranty card here, which has a uh, Nikon's Hanko or stamp, which makes it an official document here in Japan. Uh, here we have the serial number 0184. Uh, Nikon produced only 2,500 of these cameras. And uh, of course, you know, if you want to be covered by the warranty or whatever, fill this in mail. I'll, I'll of course keep it the way it is. And of course, we have a few other uh, 
uh, different bits and pieces of literature here. We have the instruction manual here, which is a, a very good copy of the original instruction manual. You can still find these uh, here in Japan. The SP was kind of a popular camera when it was released in the 50s and was sold up until 1964. Uh, the last edition was what was called the Olympic edition of the SP, which is the, the most sought after of the classic SPs. Uh, they're quite expensive nowadays, though here in Japan they aren't especially hard to find. And over here we have some documents for uh, another, uh, I guess, receipt for the, uh, the warranty card, and an invitation to join the Nikur Club. These clubs are very popular with uh, manufacturers and the public here in Japan. Uh, if you get these old cameras which still have the documents, you'll find uh, entry forms for the Yashika Club or the Minolta Club or Pintax Club. Uh, these clubs still exist in Japan today, and they hold exhibitions and competitions and uh, and day trips and things like that. And it's a lot of fun to take part in in them. Uh, I was part of the. I joined one of these clubs when I first arrived in Japan, and uh, I entered one of their contests, and I got a uh, second prize, which was a uh, 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 quite a thrill for me at the time. Uh, that was one of my uh, the first things I'd actually shot with my brand new D three hundred in those days. Uh, but this is, of course, I think, a more interesting camera. So let's go ahead and take the, the tissue off of here. And it slides off like so. I don't want to mess up anything if I can help it. We'll go ahead and set this back here, SP Limited Edition. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what this guy looks like on the inside. Lots and lots of boxes. One thing about Japan, anything that you buy here, it's kind of like one of those Russian dolls. You just keep opening it and opening it and opening it, and eventually, from the, the big box around this size, you end up to what's actually on the inside, which is this size. And, and there it is. And I'll go ahead and take it out of the, the plastic wrapper with all of its legal warnings. I don't have any babies or toddlers running around here. I don't have to worry about them eating the plastic. I do have a dog, but luckily he doesn't try to get into things like uh, uh, plastic bags. Uh, so there it is. Uh, the 2005 Nikon SP Limited Edition Rangefinder Camera. And what's really interesting I think, about these cameras is the difficulty uh, and the trouble Nikon went to to remanufacture these. Of course, the, the 2005 SP wasn't the first of the classic cameras which were uh, reproduced. Uh, though Nikon had planned to reproduce this camera, when they first took a look at it, they thought it might be too difficult. Uh, so they instead opted for the, the less complicated uh, S3, which had uh, quite a few less parts in it. And even though the S3 was a uh, simpler and less complicated camera, uh, Nikon ran into no end of uh, troubles and had lots of problems and obstacles which they had to overcome before they finally got that camera going. Uh, the issue with these things is they didn't have any of the original tooling left over from the 1950s. That was quickly sold off or scrapped or whatever. And most of the people who had actually built these cameras back in the day had long since retired and uh, the handful who still remained, didn't their memories weren't exactly fresh. They, they couldn't just hop back on the assembly line and start making these things again. And though Nikon still had the original plans and uh, patent drawings and things like that, they didn't have any actual uh, assembly instructions on how to put it together. You know, you, you can get a, a blown up picture of a camera or a complicated mechanism, but there's a step-by-step -step process which you have to follow in order to put it together so it works properly, and Nikon didn't have this. So their, their process at the beginning with the, the SP was a very kind of like trial by error. And in the early days with, the, with their assembly line, they were only completing one camera per day. So that was a, you know, a, a real difficult thing. And though they had planned to try to actually make money in the sale of these cameras, in the long run, I think they just kind of broke even with them. Uh, but I am quite glad that they went to the trouble to make them and that they actually made it possible for people in, in the modern era to be able to own a brand new example of a very beautiful mechanical piece of wonderful workmanship. There's, there's not too much good I can say about these cameras. So before I go ahead and... Uh, uh, give you more details on this camera. I'm going to take a break for just a moment. I'm breaking this video into bits because uh, people keep ringing on my doorbell every like 10 or 15 minutes or so and I don't want that to happen in the middle of one of these clips. So uh, I'll go ahead and set this back down and I'll be back in just a moment. All right, 
So uh, let's go ahead and uh, continue our description of the SP. As I said, this uh, camera was developed in, in the 1950s, and it's pretty much a state-of-the-art camera of the era. Uh, this was a rangefinder camera, which meant you uh, look through the viewfinder, and there's a rangefinder uh, window on this side, and a prism inside the camera and a reflecting mirror causes the images, a split image, to diverge or converge, and when they line up, what you are focusing at is in focus, and you can take a photograph. And this was kind of like the standard for professional cameras until the SLR camera was perfected. Uh, there are some advantages that a uh, rangefinder camera has over the SLR camera. Uh, one of the things is the design of the rangefinder camera places the lens very close uh, to the film. Whereas with a uh, uh, SLR camera, they require a, a reflex uh, or retrofocus system uh, in order to uh, cover the distance between the lens itself and the film because there has to be a mirror box and prism system in between. And the farther the lens is uh, from the film, the more potential for error there is. So a camera like a rangefinder camera or a more modern uh, mirrorless camera, which can put the lens very close to the film, is going to be able to get more performance out of the lens or at least... Uh, you know, uh, a more uh, more precision. Uh, it, it's it's it simply works better that way. It's not to say that SLR cameras are, are inferior in in the quality of the pictures they can take, but they they just can't be as superior as these old rangefinder cameras. The fit and finish of the 2005 SP is quite amazing. This is actually the second one of these cameras I had about 10 or 11 years ago. I bought a 2005 uh, limited SP body. Uh, at the Lemon Shaw uh, company or store in Ginza and I got it because I wanted to use it with a Millennium Nikkor lens which I had acquired and it was just the perfect combination. I really loved the camera and at the time I was also uh, shooting uh, a Leica uh, uh, MP which was my, my dream camera of that time and quite to my surprise I, I found that I preferred the viewfinder on the SP over the MP and the MP is pretty much the gold standard when it comes to uh, the viewfinder rangefinder system in a, uh, I guess, rangefinder film camera. Uh, the digital cameras which Leica produce are very similar to the, the MP. But uh, yes, I, I really love the SP and I especially loved the, the frame line selector system. Now, uh, the, the MP has uh, the, of course, M style automatic frame selection system. You put the lens on and the lens engages the, the switch mechanism, which uh, changes the, the frame lines in the viewfinder. And then there's a, a kind of way where you can switch them manually on the side. An issue which I've had with some Leicas, uh, at least two of them, is that this selector sometimes sticks. And uh, you, know, you put on the lens and the, the, the frame lines don't change. On the SP here, there's a manual setting for changing uh, the, the frame lines to match the lens. And we have settings here from uh, 5 to 13.5, and that's, of course, 50 millimeter to 135 millimeter, which was the standard lens and the most popular uh, telephoto lengths. Uh, the two important lenses for this camera were the 50 millimeter and the 105 millimeter, which was a very highly regarded lens and which was so popular in the rangefinder cameras that uh, Nikon made an SLR version for its later cameras. Uh, but besides this, besides the fact that we have these uh, these frame lines available, there's an, ex an accessory or built-in finder here on the left side of the main finder. And this one has frame lines for the 28mm and 35mm lenses. So this camera is able to shoot anywhere from 28mm to 135mm, uh, all these lenses without requiring an additional accessory finder on the top and also because it has two different systems it allows the viewfinder to be uh, less cluttered up than it would otherwise be if it had all of the frame lines kind of jammed in there and also uh, make it less complicated even though the the viewfinder and rangefinder system on this is extremely complicated and that was one of the big problems which they had when they were reproducing this camera was the optics and the, the issues involved with you know the, the viewfinder rangefinder system were just very difficult to overcome Quite interestingly, at the time this camera was being made, uh, Nikon was also producing the FM3A, which happened to be in the same building. And if I had to pick a, a competitor for uh, the best Nikon film camera of all time, uh, the FM3A would probably be right next to the, the limited edition SP. As I've already mentioned, the, the frame line selector switch, we have this uh, rewind lever here, which is the same which you find. Uh, this, supposedly this is a little bit different than the uh, uh, earlier Nikon SP, uh, I'm not um, enough of a Nikon aficionado to be able to tell the difference. 
Here we have the shoe for a uh, mounting uh, flash gun. It's kind of a, a hot shoe. There's an electronic contact in the middle, and of course there's a PC sync socket here for mounting uh, uh, a flash without the the adapter which fits here. This is much better than the later professional Nikons which had the odd combination of the flash sync thing located over the rewind knob which meant to rewind the film you either had to rewind it using a motor drive or take it off and do it manually. By having it here it was a much simpler system. Here we have the uh, shutter speed dial and it has teeth all the way around it. And Nikon made an, an accessory light meter which you could slide onto the shoe and which engaged the shutter speed dial. And by turning the uh, shutter speed dial and reading the light meter, you could easily set the correct aperture setting. Uh, here we have the shutter release button and we have a collar around it with an A and R setting. A settings for operating the camera and to rewind the film, you turn it to the R setting. Uh, here we have the film winding and shutter charging lever. That's wonderfully smooth. Quite amazing to feel that. It's very smooth, very easy to press or wind. It's not like the, the F, which is a very almost identical system. Indeed, the parts are interchangeable between the F. And this camera actually uses a Nikon F winding lever, not the stamped steel lever, which you usually find, but the solid lever, which uh, was standard on this camera as well as the Olympic version. But since it doesn't have the reflex mirror and other mechanism to wind up, much less effort. Here we have the film counter window, and here we have a selector between uh, 24 and 36. If I remember correctly, the original camera had a 20 and 36, but I might be mistaken about that. Over here we have the ring which you use to uh, focus the lens. And there's kind of a locking lever on here. If you're using the standard lens, there's an infinity lock. If you're using these lenses which use the external helicoid, there is no lock. Uh, it, it, it unlocks automatically. To remove the 35 millimeter lens, you have to uh, kind of uh, unlock the collar here and turn it. And here you can see the uh, uh, distance scale as well as the depth of field scale. And if you're using the standard lens or some of the other lenses, they use uh, the internal uh, system for mounting the lens, whereas the wide angle and some of the telephoto lenses use the external system. And you kind of just line up the marks like that to put it back on and it locks into place. Uh, of course, I've already mentioned the viewfinder window. Uh, here we have the matte glass, which it projects lines onto the frame lines. The frame lines in the Nikon SP are colored. This was an issue for Nikon because uh, they didn't really know what the true colors of these were supposed to be because the material which they had left over from the old days was all faded out. So it was quite a difficult time to, to come up with as close as they could the original colors. And of course, we, here we have the window for the rangefinder mirror. Here we have the uh, self timer. And what I read about this was when they made it for the S3, uh, they couldn't find anyone who still made these. And they had a really difficult time. They, they hired a contractor to make them. But uh, the plans which they sent, I guess the drawings, the, the contractor misread them and wasn't able to get the timer to work right. So Nikon eventually decided to make these in-house. And these are, there are two styles of this. This is the later style, you can tell by the... Well, maybe you can't tell, but I can tell by the... Uh, the, I guess, the knurling or whatever you want to call it, the slots milled into the surface. On the bottom of the camera, we have the uh, release lever for removing the film back. We have a standard quarter inch tripod socket. And here we have a reminder dial for setting the uh, film speed. Once, uh, once again, this is just a reminder. Uh, you can set this to whatever you like. It doesn't affect the operation of the camera. Uh, opening the back is just like the old Nikon Fs. You turn it leftwards and pop it off like so. And we still have the protective cover over the uh, uh, shutters, the shutter curtains. Uh, one thing to keep an eye on with these cameras is since you have to remove the back from the camera whenever you load film, uh, it's very easy to drop or step on these covers. So you have to be especially careful with them. And if you break or damage one of these things, you'll probably have to buy another camera to get uh, a part to use because you won't be able to find an extra one. Uh, you can use the backs off of the S2 or S3, which are less expensive cameras, and, and they will work, but uh, uh, you'll probably have to have it painted to match unless you don't mind the silver color. One way to tell the original uh, Nikon black paint cameras from the reproductions is the Nikon ones always have the chrome-plated rivets, and the ones which have been repainted, invariably they just paint over the rivets, and those are black as well. And let's go ahead and slide this back on. Uh, the lens itself, this is the 
35 millimeter f 1.8 lens and when this lens was released in the 1950s this was uh, the fastest 35 millimeter lens on the market and it remained so until uh, uh, Leica came out with their 35mm f1.4 Summilux. Uh, this was a wonderful performer of a lens and it's quite highly regarded and it's been copied by different manufacturers for different uh, cameras over the years. Uh, I think uh, the Konica's Hexar uh, rangefinder, or not, not rangefinder camera, but their, their Hexar AF which is a very popular street photography camera uh, that has a, something of a copy of the design of this lens and if I remember right so is the, the latest uh, uh, Fujinon lens for their X series cameras, the the 35 millimeter f 1.4. Uh, it, it shows what a wonderful design this is. Uh, this camera features the same optical design, but better glass and uh, better coatings than the original lens had. The original lens used uh, thorium glass and elements and coatings, which uh, reduced the chromatic aberrations, but uh, yellowed over time. Uh, you can remove the yellowing easy enough by using a UV light, but the newer lenses use uh, improved coatings, improved glass, and a lot of the they were able to switch to uh, fluorite glass in the 1970s, which did away with the need for using was it um, uh, the, the old radioactive thorium glass. Uh, this camera comes with the original lens hood, and this is a reproduction of the original 35 millimeter f1.0 lens hood, and the original ones are ridiculously expensive. Uh, here in Japan, if you find them, they they cost like six hundred dollars and up. Uh, if you're if you're lucky enough to see one, uh, luckily, uh, you know, yeah, you can. This this camera comes with one, though. I don't really like the design of this lens hood. I prefer the the vented lens hoods, so I can actually see through them, and it makes shooting the camera easier. I love the lens cap. The original lens caps on these cameras were made out of uh, plastic. Some of them were metal. This particular one is made of metal and it feels better than the plastic ones which I, I find on the other vintage cameras. Uh, but yeah, what can I say about this camera? It's just a, it's a work of art. It's quite amazing uh, and I'm really looking forward to using it. I, I'm kind of cringing at the thought of taking a, a brand new camera which is uh, as collectible as one of these and actually taking it outside and shooting with it but uh, that, that's the reason I got it so I, I, I suppose I should go ahead and go out and do it. Uh, for those of you who are interested uh, and would like to have one of these, I can still find them from he here in Japan from time to time. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, figure uh, one in this condition between five and six thousand dollars, depending on whether it's a hundred percent complete or say ninety percent complete. Uh, if you'd like one, let me know. I can probably track one down for you. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like a, a gift to myself after a, a very good year. I was kind of like a. a on the fence trying to decide whether I wanted an SP or another uh, Leica uh, MP and when I remembered the experience I had between the two cameras uh, the SP to me seemed the better choice and the fact that uh, uh, this is still I think a better deal than the SP I, I think I paid a lot less for this than what I would have paid for uh, a new MP body and even used ones here as it is like Leica seems to be uh, behind the the game and producing their MP cameras and they're very short of them uh, here in Japan so they're kind of on back order. Odd that uh, a camera like this uh, is easier to find than a Leica MP but uh, I hear it is. But anyway, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or any comments about the, the Nikon SP Limited or uh, anything else, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Uh, uh, of course, I'm always getting more cameras, which I plan to do videos about. And if you'd like to see these, uh, you, you just subscribe and you'll, you'll know when they come out. And as I'm always trying to get more people interested in vintage cameras and photography, uh, uh, if you click the like button, uh, that helps a lot. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again soon.